Good morning. Today I'm going to talk about um, soil nail wall basics. So let's start by looking at what a soil nail wall is. Well, a soil nail wall is a technique that reinforces and strengthens the soil. It's used in cut scenarios as the construction proceeds from the top down. The reinforcements are nails, which are drilled holes in the ground with uh, steel bars placed in them with uh, grout that surrounds them. These are passive anchors. In other words, in order for them to get loaded, the face has to be loaded on this so the soil has to move. And the nails themselves limit displacement. What you see here is a construction sequence. If you start at the very top, you'll see that we first make a cut. That's if the soil itself can stand. Um, assuming it can, then the hole is drilled. Um, the tendon is placed inside of it. The hole's grouted. Shotcrete is placed on the face with wire mesh with a drain, drainage mat placed behind it. And then this process continues from the top working down. These are most commonly seen in Texas uh, on our U-turns um, because these are a great, great use of that wall. In order to obtain a, a good soil nail wall, there's various aspects that need to be uh, looked at and included. They start with design and then detail sheets, the specification, of course, and construction. Due to time constraints, we're going to focus really on design and detail sheets and touch upon um, the new spec specification that came out. Now, when we talk about soil nail walls, unlike MSC walls, um, these are not a standard. There's not a proprietary system out there. And complete details need to be provided. And the reason for that is these are designed for the specific site conditions that exist at the location where they're going to be installed. On the right-hand side, you see some examples of detail sheets that would be included in the plans. Now, when we start, we start with a layout. Well, the layout needs to first show us that it's actually in a cut scenario. We see the top of the wall, and then here in the dashed line, what you see is the actual ground line at this location. Um, in addition, then we need soil borings that actually go through the nailed portion of the wall. All right, It does us no good if these are located far away or start over here somewhere and work downwards, because we're going to use the borings to help us in the design. When we look at the layout, we want to try and obtain separation from an abutment all right, so that we can actually get our nails in. Um, this is very similar to what happens with MSC walls. Um, we want to limit the embedment to the base, roughly two feet. And then when we look at the bottom of the wall, we need to consider future excavation. All right? There could be, for example, storm sewer pipes installed. There could be um, a widening of a roadway in the future, which then would increase the height of the wall. When we look at this, we need to take that into account when we first start our design. Now we're going to talk about design. There are various tools available. Uh, predominantly, one of the most important manuals is uh, FHWA's recently revised uh, soil nail wall uh, reference manual, GEC 7, that stands for Geotechnical Engineering Circular 7, is the manual that, that governs that. There are, in addition, various computer programs available, um, Gold Nail and S Nail have been used in the past. More recently, SNAP2, which was put out by FHWA, is the more recent uh, program that's being used. When we look at the design, we need various things, and one of which is the soil parameters. Um, we need the drain soil parameters. Why? Because this is what's going to actively load the face of the wall, and that load is then going to be transferred to our soil nails. And so we can get the drain parameters from laboratory tests, which is often very difficult, um, and we don't get sometimes useful results from them. Um, we can do it by correlations, such as the one shown on the right, where PI is uh, correlated with a friction angle. And then um, if people have local experience or have um, data that uh, come from other projects, then they can use that as long as it's close in proximity. 
when we look at it, we want to minimize the cohesion. And the reason for this is that in the long term, it acts almost under normally consolidated clays, acts like um, almost like a sand or a cohesionless material, and the cohesion degrades and becomes very low. What cohesion will do for you, of course, is if you increase the cohesion, it will actually make the soil stand, and therefore the wall isn't needed. Um, over the long term, that's not what we've observed. Um, and the drain friction angle is typically, again, it varies, but it's typically between 24 and 34 degrees. Another parameter that we're going to need um, is the ultimate pullout resistance, and this is the uh, ultimate shear resistance that acts as we engage the nail, and this is um, the shear or the shear stress per foot of nail. Um, in determining this, this is actually just like calculating skin friction on a pile or drill shaft. Um, anyone who's familiar, this would be our unit skin friction. Um, and you can determine that using our Texas cone penetrometer test. Another aspect that needs to be considered is our spacing. Um, what we see here are some guidelines for this. Our vertical spacings tend to be uh, fairly tight, uh, typically three to four feet. Our horizontal spacings are three to four and a half feet. Um, our top nail is usually within the top two and a half feet. Um, and then our bottom nail is within the bottom three feet and then it's spaced. Now, the nail spacing then impacts the loading. Why? The wider the spacing, the greater the load that occurs on the nails. We have to be very careful in some clay soils, especially higher PI soils. And when I talk about high PI soils here, I'm referring to um, in general, 20 or, or above, we need to use a tighter spacing. And the reason for this, as we'll see in a, in a little bit, is the loads actually can increase over time. And by widening your spacing, if you start with a load that's fairly high, that's going to increase and have a potential for pullout or other effects. Another factor that we need to consider in design is our head strength. Well, our head strength is the actual anchorage where the nail connects to the face. And this is structurally determined by looking at either pullout or flexural behavior of the face. Um, in general, when we use higher and higher head strengths, what this does is it tends to shorten our nails. Um, and then it translates to oftentimes where our bottom nails carry a disproportionate amount of our load. This is exactly opposite as to what occurs in, in experience and in, in the field. So we don't want our lowest nails to carry the highest load. In fact, we want the upper part of the wall to carry the highest loads. Depending upon your program that you're using, you can adjust the head strength to obtain what would be considered a match or um, a design that meets what experience tells us with the upper half of the wall carrying the large part of the load. And when I say experience, it's not just my personal feeling, but it's published. On the right here is a plot of nail head depth versus the height of the wall. So zero is the very top, one is at the bottom. Normalized load here on the right. The red lines bracket the data. And what you see is that the top in general carries the higher percentage of load and as we get to the bottom it falls off. We had a research project where we monitored a, a wall recently um, in high PI clays um, with instrumented nails from top to bottom. We used uh, vibrating wire strain gauges, that's what VW stands for in this uh, diagram. And on the bottom what you're seeing is from here down, this is your first row of nails, which would correspond to the top up here. This is your bottom row. And what you're seeing is the maximum load at the end of construction shows a similar pattern as we just observed on the right. The upper part of your wall is carrying the large part of the load. The middle part seems to be more or less even, but it falls off at the bottom. Now, one interesting aspect is they monitored this over a one-year time frame, and the loads actually increased over time. 
Um, in general, row two actually decreased, but in general, the rest of them increased over time. Uh, this is believed to be due to the creep of the soil, and so this is why we want our nails to be tighter spaced in these conditions. I said we'd touch briefly on our uh, soil nail specification. We transitioned from having a statewide special spec uh, to actually including it now in our standard specifications. Um, our new spec in general uh, is an update and it includes uh, materials, equipment. Under equipment, it gives uh, requirements for what's suitable and what's unsuitable. Um, discusses construction, testing, and then measurement and payment. Now, let's, let's get into sometimes where problems occur, and that's in um, detailing. We finished the design, and now we want to do the detailing of this. And details include two parts. There's usually nail layout sheets, which are shown on the top, and then our detail sheet. The detail sheet on the bottom down here governs um, construction, tells us uh, typical nail spacings, etc. Again, as I stated previously, there are not any standard sheets for these, and each wall needs to be treated individually. All right, why? Because we're designing them for the site conditions that are present. We're not designing a generic wall here. So in general, this is what our nail layout sheets would look like. Um, we identify where obstructions are. In this case, you have wing wall shafts, drill shafts. Um, throughout, we look at where the uh, abutment cap is. In general, we also look at where beams are um, so that in general, if we can put our nails in so without obstructing or without hitting the beams, we want to do that as well. And on these sheets, what we want to do is we want to uh, indicate our top and bottom of the wall. You'll notice our bottom of the wall is stepped. The reason for stepping this wall was because we we're using precast panels. Just like an MSC wall, we want to build that on a flat surface, so we step our wall. Um, and the steps would correspond with where panel breaks would be. And in general, we want to indicate where our nails are. These are the circles. We want to show the elevation of where the rows are to help the contractors and to help our inspectors. Um, we want to look at what the typical spacing is. This comes from our detail sheet. Um, and then if we have odd spacings, we want to denote what those odd spacings are we see here in between where the drill shafts are, we have uh, different spacings than what's on the outside. We want to be able to note that. Now, we can't always clear obstructions, all right? Our specification says that we can alter up to 10 degrees. When we get beyond that, we need to notify both the inspector and the contractor of the angle. And that angle is shown here where we clearly state what direction and what the angle is. This is from uh, a line that's perpendicular to the wall. And the reason for this is, as we see in schematically up on the top, is we don't want nails that end up crisscrossing each other or interfering with each other. And then we also want to avoid our obstructions. So when we do this, we need to actually put the angle and the direction on the plans. Now this is an, uh, the detail sheet. This is gonna be used to uh, look at various features on this, such as a summary table and nail testing. What we see here is our summary. We need to denote this, all right? Contractors need to know what the total length of nail is and then what the various sizes are. The various sizes are shown in various sections, all right? In our situation, we categorize the wall by section, all right? In this case, the reason for the long nails for very short height here is this had a near infinite slope on it. So we also have down here our typical or max spacing, all right? And then we turn to our nail testing, all right? There are two types of tests, um, this section and this one here denote our verification tests. Um, these are done prior to construction. And then we have our proof nail tests, which is shown here. 
These are selected by the engineer in the field, and they're to verify that the contractor's methods are consistent throughout um, installation. As I stated, verification tests are performed on sacrificial nails. Um, they're done prior to construction, and this is where we're actually testing two things. We're testing our assumption of the strength of the soil, and then we're also testing the contractor's installation methods. Additionally, we have the proof tests. These are on production soil nails. Um, when we do these, they should chip out the shotcrete face if, it, if the face is there um, and actually leave at least an inch gap so we don't have bearing of the grout onto the shotcrete. Um, these are performed to a low, lower load because these actually get encapsulated into the wall and are used uh, for production in the wall. Um, these basically test the contractor's methods of installation and make sure that they're consistent throughout. Now this is a, our important sheet. Um, this pretty much summarizes all the details that go into our uh, soil nail wall. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to walk through and sort of look at the different aspects here that are shown. Um, the first aspect is our typical wall profile. Um, this is not drawn to scale. This is just schematic. What it does is it shows our typical spacing, which in this case was uh, three by three. It tells us what our max and minimum are for our nails at the top, our nails at the bottom. It denotes where we have prefabricated drainage mats, um, which are spaced out at 10 foot maximum. And this is schematically shown. The contractor will have to adjust um, in the field, but it's not to exceed the 10 inch or 10 foot, excuse me, maximum spacing. Then we have our typical wall profile, and this actually shows a couple of different things. Um, it shows what our typical bars are, uh, what the hole diameters are, and our typical inclination of the holes. Um, additionally, since this has precast panels on it, um, it shows schematically the precast panels. The connection for the precast panels to the closure pour is done by uh, the vendors or the MSC wall panel manufacturers. Um, illustrates the closure pour um, here. And then it also highlights, again, various features such as our max min at the bottom. Again, our coping at the top. This wall denotes uh, cast in place coping. Um, if we were to connect uh, precast coping, the detail would be different and that would need to be adjusted. Now, also on here, we have details which zoom in on various aspects. Uh, on the upper left, what we see is a detail that defines our sole nail length, which is from the back of the hole to the shotcrete face. As we state here, for each bar, there's six inches that need to be added, and that's subsidiary to the nail. Um, and that's to allow us to actually um, have some sticking out um, out of the face here. Um, the plates, which are denoted right here, they have um, studs on them. And then secondly is you need to make sure that you include the washer. I would add that you need to actually include a beveled washer to make sure so that we actually get it. Why? At a 10 degree dip here, if you come out with a flat washer, then um, what's going to happen is your nut's actually going to bear only on the top part and not throughout. With a beveled washer, it'll take that into account and actually secure it tightly to the face. Up at the top, we see our detail of our anchor plate. And the lower part is a detail that's often very uh, misunderstood. And that detail is of our drainage mat. On the right-hand side, what we see is what it should look like, all right? On the left-hand side, we see a schematic of that. That schematic shows the soil on this side here the actual fabric of the drainage mat should be against the soil. Water's gonna come from the soil, get into the drainage mat, and propagate downward. What's often misunderstood here is the fact that the lower mat here overlaps outside or towards the face of the wall, as shown here, over the um, upper mat. Why? Water comes from up here, comes down, 
and then drops into the lower section down here and continues and goes to some type of drainage at the bottom of the wall. That drainage then is either a weep hole, which is shown at the top, or an under drain. In most cases, the under drains often used because weep holes tend to stain the wall, and now with aesthetics being somewhat important, um, no one wants to have stains on their walls, and so the under drain is actually being used more and more. Also on this sheet are uh, general notes. I'm not going to go through all of this, but suffice it to say, this captures um, various aspects. Um, the upper part captures materials um, and also uh, what's subsidiary and what is not. Um, the next phase, and we'll look at this, uh, excuse me, yeah, we'll, well, we'll look at construction. We'll skip over uh, the nail testing. Um, this is actually now covered in our specification, um, but often in the past was included in our, our plans. And so the lower part is our construction. We're going to look at this in a minute. But if you've done walls in the past, make sure that everything in here is consistent as well as the details, but consistent with our sole nail anchor specification. I'll give you one aspect that you need to be careful of. Our pneumatically placed concrete is no longer class three. It is class two, all right? In the past, we stated uh, that it was class two, which is up here, or class three, rather. Now it's actually class three. Um, there are other aspects, but due to time, I'm going to move on. Now, in the construction, this basically dictates or indicates to the contractor what they can and can't do, all right? And in my opinion, it's very important and should be adhered to in the field. But some of these items in red are what's going to have to change depending upon material type. This first paragraph up here indicates that at no time will we have a vertical cut exposed greater than, in this case, 24 hours. This was a clay, all right? not to exceed four feet, and they can only cut the amount necessary to install a single row of nails. If, for example, they make a cut on a Thursday and it looks like rain for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, then my suggestion would be is to place soil back up against it or buttress soil against it to prevent it from um, sloughing or, or, or decaying. Um, the next important piece is down here. The permanent concrete face will be completed within 30 working days of the completion of the wall. Now, on real long walls, that may not be feasible, all right, unless they work in phases. Um, you'll have to work that out, but like I said, each one of these items in red need to be modified for the conditions that are in the field. Um, before concluding, we have various types of fascias that can be used um, in the detail sheets that were shown and, and, and indicated. We use precast panels. Um, this is what this is right here. This is a sole nail wall at the bottom with an MSC wall up above it. On the left-hand side, this is a cast-in-place um, fascia that was done actually here in Bryan. That's the intersection of State Highway 30 and State Highway 6. Um, and then it was painted to give a, a, a nice finish. At the bottom is uh, something that's come more into alignment um, to, make, to meet natural requirements. Um, this was done in Fort Worth District, um, and it matches the soil, con soil and rock conditions that are out there and gives a natural view. This is actually sculpted gunite. This is a shotcrete that's placed, and then as it's curing, they actually come in and an individual or individuals will actually hand carve this uh, pattern in the rock and that matches what the rock conditions are in the field. So in conclusion, um, soil nail walls are important. They're used in cut scenarios and they depend on proper design and details which are developed for site specific conditions and geometry. With that, um, I'm going to conclude. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Back here. Uh, no, sir. 
Um, we're working on trying to get um, something, but the problem is, is if uh, the detail sheets would have to be fairly generic with no numbers put on them or anything, because that's up to the designer and the engineer to actually put those on. Um, we're working towards that. We haven't quite got there yet. Anybody else? Michelle? A number of factors are causing us to cut that down. Um, one of which is the soil itself, all right? Um, we're learning more and more about clay soils. Uh, the research project that was uh, just completed indicates that creep not only affects pull-out capacity, but can actually affect the load that's on the nails. Therefore, it could increase over time. The other factor is that in for example, sandy or sandier conditions, it's controlled a lot by what can actually stand up, all right, what, can, what, what we can do. And then the last piece is, uh, <laughs> I hate to say, but um, contractors, what, what can and can't be done. When we go to wider and wider spacing, we're relying on the nails to carry more and more load. And if they're not installed properly or you know, uh, adhered to what our details are, then we end up with problems. And so some of that is, is wrapped up in all three of those. Uh, we're out of time.